Bible. So we've talked about a lot of history within the Bible, things that we don't necessarily read out of the Bible because they're secular history things that kind of influence um, what's going on, like the 400 years of silence and the destruction of the temple and those sorts of things. And, and hopefully you enjoy that. But now we're going to switch gears and we're going later in history. And eventually what we're going to be talking about is when was the Bible put together that we have today? Uh, how did we get those books? Why are there some books that aren't included in that? Um, why are other books included in that? Um, like the Apocrypha, what about that? Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls contain the book of Maccabees. Why, aren't that, uh, why, why isn't that book in our Bible? And we're going to be answering some of those tougher questions, and it'll make sense once we talk about it. Um, but that will be uh, at least next week. And today is actually going to be something that we've already presented on a Sunday morning. And it's about um, the, hit, or the uh, facts that we have within archaeology today uh, and the prophecies to be able to tell whether or not the Bible can even be trusted. And this is the reason why I'm starting with this is even though we've already gone through this, I think we'll have time. We can ask more questions, give some more details that we didn't get to cover on a Sunday morning because of the environment and time limits. Uh, and also my hope is once we know we can pr uh, trust the Bible for sure, then we can look at the process of how it came about. Okay, once we know we can trust it, once we can believe it with all our heart and not have any doubts about it, then it's really easy to, to see how God was bringing all this together and, and, and trust me to click and there's a reason why we're doing it this way. So we're going to be talking about if we can trust the Bible that we have in our hands today. So the next biggest book uh, compared to the Bible, there, there's three big holy books, okay? So there's the Bible, the Jewish Bible, which is just the Old Testament. And then the third and final one that we wouldn't know about, because obviously the Old Testament is within our Bible, uh, is the Quran. And that would be the book that who would use? What religion uses the Quran? The, the Muslims, right? That is an Islamic uh, book. So this is just a comparison between the Bible that we have and the Quran. You can see some details. Hopefully I'm not staying in the way. Um, you can see the Bible has between 25 and 50,000 plus manuscripts. So why is there such a window? That, that's a big difference, right? Um, if I owe Ernie Kaufman between 25,000 and 50,000 um, dollars, there's a big difference between those two things, right? Um, or if you were, if you found twenty-five thousand to fifty thousand dollars out on the road, which do you think you'd rather it be, the twenty-five thousand or the fifty thousand? Well, probably the fifty thousand because that's that's quite a bit more, right? Um, so why is this twenty-five to fifty thousand? Well, there's a few reasons. So these go through a process where they are tested to be authentic. What we don't want are modern-day made copies. Uh, to be forged to look old and then be sold as original manuscripts. Now, why would we not want that? They'd be false. Do you think you can add subtle details that might change things? Sure. Now, why would people do that? Money. Okay, if you can make these books seem thousands of years old, you think there's some money in that for you? Absolutely. Um, China is the world's largest manufacturer of fake fossils and there are several transitional fossils they call them um, that come out of China every year where these guys will fabricate a fossil based off what um, some uh, archaeologists or paleontologists will want to see like they'll, you, they'll get a, a dinosaur and a bird and they'll blend them together and, and they forge all these different fossils and then sell them out and they've actually tricked Nat Geo I, I mean dozens of times was like, we finally found the missing link. And they're like, oh, wait, that's fake. Uh, uh, we're still looking for the missing link. And they, uh, so China does this thing with fossils. There's a lot of people in the Middle East that do this thing um, with these manuscripts, uh, whether it's personal motivation by money, per uh, personal motivation by power or, or pride, whatever it is, there's quite a bit of incentive for these guys to fake these and sell them out there. And matter of fact, I remember... Uh, my dad and I would always watch Pawn Stars, if you guys ever watched that. And sometimes what would happen is they would get things in and they would have a fake patina on them. 
right? It'd be a, a musket. They would beat it up, bury it in the dirt, pull it up you know, a few weeks later. And they're like, ah, oh, it's a Civil War musket now. And they could usually see through these fakes. But sometimes the difference between a fake or a copy and the genuine real thing, uh, I mean, I'm sure on the right thing could be millions of dollars between something that looks old and something that is actually old. So they're going through a process of being validated. People are faking them. So that's why we have to check that. It's a slow process. And another reason is, is because some people don't know what to count as a manuscript. Some of these are as long as books. Some of them are as long as multiple books. Um, some of these collections contain the whole entire Old Testament. Others are sentences. And some yet are even fractions of sentences. And they have to figure out, well, is this a early church letter or is this actually a snippet of the book of Romans? Is this a uh, church letter for encouragement or did this come out of the book of Philippians? And there's some debate by that. So there's at least 25,000 confirmed and there are another 25,000 waiting to go through this uh, process where they figure out whether or not it's authentic. The Quran has 60 manuscripts. Seems uh, a bit forged on my end, but you can Google it. You will find that it has 60 manuscripts. Do you see a difference between these two? Absolutely. I mean, are these even comparable when it comes to amount of uh, manuscripts? Uh, yeah, so 60, 25 to 50,000. Uh, we're talking a different ball game here. And now this number is really important because the more of these we have, the more, uh, well, the easier it is to see how consistent the Bible was when it was put together. And also there's more chances for it um, to have contradictions. And now that doesn't seem like a, a perk for Christianity, right? That we're more susceptible to contradictions. But actually what we're going to see is that there's so few contradictions that this works in our favor because this should hurt us and it actually ends up being one of our largest proofs uh, as to why the Bible should be trusted. Now I'm going to read from 2 Timothy 3.16, a verse that you guys are well aware of. Uh, All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The Bible is useless if it's not true. If it's not true, it can't be trusted. And if it can't be trusted, we shouldn't be following it. Right? Jesus Christ in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, the first part, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. During the time of Jesus Christ, he had all these different philosophies, people saying, follow me, uh, follow this belief, follow this God, have this idol in your house. And they were uh, going through and they, they would collect these people. Uh, matter of fact, you remember in, in Greece, all these philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, uh, and I mean, the list can go on of all the philosophers, and they're all saying, I have the true way of interpreting the world, follow me. And Jesus Christ comes out, and he doesn't give all these big elaborate theories or anything like that. He simply says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what he did is he upset the whole entire world with that statement. And it proves to be true over and over again. So uh, there's a lot of issues that the Bible um, won't make you popular on. Right? The Bible has been counterculture since its existence. It has been counterculture uh, culture again, uh, from the beginning of its existence. Would it be worth the persecution um, that you might receive for following the Bible if it's not true? I don't think so. Do you think I like getting mocked, rejected, or having to deprive myself of a temptation I might have? No, that's not enjoyable to me, but I uh, submit to that and accept it. Why? Because it's true. If it's not true, it's not worth doing. Okay, so the Bible is actually the leading document when it comes to figuring out archaeological finds in the Middle East. So when Paul talks to Timothy, he says all scripture 
uh, you know, and, and then gives a list, you know, is inspired and able for reproof and correction, the good works of it. You know, it gives this list of uh, all these things it's good for because it's true. Um, what scriptures were he, was he talking about in the immediate context? Did they have the New Testament yet? No. Does that mean that the New Testament uh, shouldn't be trusted? No. We'll, we'll talk about that too next week. Um, but the scriptures that exist during this time are out of the Old Testament. Now, there's two things I think is interesting about that. Uh, maybe more than two things. There's some things I think are interesting. First off, you can know salvation through the Old Testament. Now, we prove doctrines through the New Testament, which talk about Jesus abundantly. Don't make it too hard. The apostles in the early church went to the Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs. They went through the whole Old Testament. They were able to prove Jesus Christ, his character, his work, and his redemption through the Old Testament. That's pretty impressive. Because a lot of Christians, to be honest, can't do that through the New Testament where it makes it easy. They were able to prove that through the Old Testament, and they were able to know that through the Old Testament. Okay, another thing I find interesting about that <clears throat> is that through the Old Testament, someone could be righteous. Not by the following of the law, though, but by the knowledge that a Savior would come. Now, it's easy for us when we read through, uh, you know, say, Isaiah 53, or the end of Ezekiel, right? When God's restoring this kingdom, and he's talking about saying a new kingdom and gathering a new people and raising up a king that would uh, defeat their bondage and stuff. We understand that to be Jesus Christ establishing the church by setting them free from their sin. We can do that because we know of Jesus Christ already. Okay, and we have the New Testament to back that up. The apostles were able to use the Old Testament, show how those prophecies pointed towards Jesus, explain the life of Jesus, and it's not like a few people believed. Within hundreds of years, the national religion of Rome would become uh, Christianity, and then soon it would be plagued, and eventually um, the papacy and things like that would start. And, uh, it would get to where the, the first uh, pope would come about in 606. Um, AD and that would be as a result of the Roman uh, government pushing its officials into the Christian church so it's being used all the time to find uh, ancient uh, civilizations and things that shouldn't exist because they say they don't exist and then we read the Bible we figure out oh it's between this river and, and that mountain and then we dig there and you know what we eventually find what the Bible says the Quran no not even. So this is what I think is actually pretty interesting. Uh, the city of Mecca, and we're, we'll talk about this later because eventually we're actually going to be comparing Christianity and Islam, uh, you know, the Muslim faith with the Christian faith. So Mecca, the holy city of the Muslims, has this much excavation going on in it. People in the past have tried. They couldn't find any of the things um, that were supposed to be there, uh, that Muhammad said would be there, so they shut off any form of uh, archaeology uh, archaeology, and that, and you're not allowed to dig. Even if you're a Muslim trying to prove the Quran to be true, you can't dig in there. And Christianity says, search and you'll find. Right? That's the difference between these two uh, religions. So here's where it gets interesting. This is where we know that only one of these two books can be true. Uh, who in here knew that the Quran actually mentions Jesus? Okay. Did you know that it calls Jesus a prophet sent by God? Okay. Uh, did you know that the, uh, that the Quran even says that Jesus will come back and be the judge of the unrighteous and righteous during the second coming? Did you know that the Quran believes in a second coming? Most people don't realize how close the Quran and, Christ, er, and the Bible are when it comes to eschatology, the study of the end times. Uh, and, and this is interesting too, I have here. Uh, the Quran even mentions Jesus' virgin birth. But you know what it doesn't mention? The death, burial, and resurrection. See, the way that the Quran has is basically 
God teleports Jesus into heaven. And someday he comes back the way he, he left. That's the way that the Quran has it going. The way that the Bible has it going is that Jesus Christ died, was buried for three days, and resurrected, lived on the earth for 40 days, ascended into heaven, and someday in the last times, which we're in because the last times are just the times after Jesus Christ, he will come back and he will judge the world. So the only detail that's really different is whether or not Jesus died uh, and resurrected. That is the only detail. I mean, there's more details, like uh, there's certain things that are completely false in the Quran. We'll probably talk about those too. But as a whole, that's the big difference between these two books, which is why if you remember when we went through this series, uh, we spent so much time proving that Jesus Christ resurrected based off uh, different testimonies and quotes based off ancients and the different events. Like you remember we had uh, two uh, testimonies about the earth turning dark in the year 33 AD and uh, how that was witnessed in Africa and in Scotland. And we looked at all these different testimonies regarding those things and some arguments. And that's why that was so important. Now, we all believe in the resurrection, and we're not necessarily going to prove that. Uh, that video is online if anyone needs to remind themselves of that resource. But we're, uh, for the sake of this lesson, just going to assume that the resurrection happened and that their Quran is dismissed because it doesn't mention a death of Jesus Christ. So... <clears throat> This guy here, his name is Bart Ehrman. He is probably the leading uh, critic when it comes to New Testament studies. He makes commentaries of the Bible. And what he does is he actually goes into colleges and he converts several people by showing how the Bible isn't uh, able to be trusted. And I found this guy and I started researching him and I started listening to some of the things he was saying. And I was like, I'm really having a hard time explaining this. Like, uh, he'll bring up examples. I'm like, well, how does that work? Or how does this work? Or, and he started making me question my faith as a preacher. Someone who went to seminary to know the answers to this stuff. And within five minutes, I'm already questioning my faith. And then you know what I found? If I actually, like, dug this deep into research, I found the answer. And I'll give you an example of one that I personally struggled with. You read through the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that Jesus Christ died on what day? Friday. But what day was, what, what, what was special about it? Passover. So they're worried because Passover's coming, they have to get him buried into the ground. Right before Passover, otherwise the whole city is unclean. You read John, though, and John says it's the day of preparation for the Passover. One day before the Passover. And that's what it says. You can read it. Three of the Gospels say Jesus Christ dies on the Passover. One Gospel says that he dies the day before Passover. Or so he thought. And so I thought. So this is what I found. You had a week of Passover, and then you had Passover proper. Jesus died on Passover proper. But what you would do on the day of Passover is you would prepare for the week of Passover, the seven days of Passover to the next Sabbath. So although it was Passover proper, you know, when they would paint the blood on the doorpost, it was also the day of preparation of Passover. They were taking the leaven out of their bread. Uh, leaven out of their bread. They were taking the leaven out of the house. They're taking out all these unclean things from their house, removing them for a week. And during that time, they're also getting stocked up on food and, and other things. So this isn't the day, just the day that they're slaughtering the lamb, though they did, obviously in a typological sense. This is also the day they're getting ready for the week of Passover. So which one's right, John or Matthew, Mark, and Luke? They all are. They say the same thing in a different way. And all you have to do is study that and figure out, oh, okay, well, that makes perfect sense. The culture agrees with that. Uh, Josephus, all these Jewish historians would confirm that completely. Um, so why would he get settled on something like that? Personally, I think he makes too much money trying to disprove the Bible. And uh, you want to be frank, I think he's got some help in a spiritual sense too 
but not from the same spiritual uh, side that we would fight on. So this is what he says. This is during one of his lectures. So what do we know today about the numbers of mistakes in our manuscripts? Well, Mill looked at 100 manuscripts, and now we have 5,700 manuscripts. Nobody knows how many differences there are among the manuscripts uh, that we now have, because nobody yet, even with the development of computer technologies, nobody has been able to add up all of the differences. Sometimes uh, scholars guess that there may be a couple hundred thousand differences. Some people say 300,000, some say 400,000. Uh, there are different guesses. The way I usually put it to my students is in, in comparative terms. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Okay, everybody hear that? Okay, so he says we have all these manuscripts. There's more contradictions and the manuscripts, and there are words in the Bible. And we're going to talk about that because actually that's uh, contradictory in terms, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. So he says this quite a while ago. And at this point, we didn't have many manuscripts. We have a whole lot more now, which by his logic would mean that we have more contradictions now. We actually don't. And we're going to talk about what he calls a contradiction because uh, that's it's really a uh, semantic argument. He says it's one thing, but really, if people know what he was calling a contradiction, it's, it's not anything. I mean, it's like missing periods. There's not a comma. The words are... It, it, um, and then he says there's more contradictions in the Bible than there are words in your Bible. It doesn't work that way. You can only have as many contradictions in the Bible as words. You can't have more. It doesn't work that way. I'll give you an example of how they do this in evolution. In evolution, we're taught that we share between 96 and 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. We have 3 billion nucleic pairs. There's 3 billion genes that make everybody here you, you. Right? 3 billion of those bad boys. Chimpanzees have over 4 billion. That means in the beginning, we can only share up to 75% of our DNA in common. They can only have 75% of ours because we only have, they have a, a whole other, you know, billion uh, pairs that we don't have. So out of the gate, that number is skewed. And what they also do there is they actually compare certain parts. They compare the parts that make, or that mammals have in common with each other. So you could actually take that same number or that same set of qualifications, compare us to hippos. In a lot of ways, you can compare us to a fish and all these different animals and find out that we have 99% of the same DNA. Well, yeah, because you're looking at the DNA it takes to make eyes or lungs or guts or to have solid bones in our body. They take those common traits, look at the DNA that makes those common traits and say, ah, oh, we have that in common. I could have told you that, dummy. You don't have to tell me that. I, I know that we share the same DNA that makes organs and things like that. So they lie with that. Actually, this is kind of funny. An atheist got so upset with them for doing that because he thought it was really on an atheist that he did the same thing with a banana. You know how much DNA you share with a banana? 99%. He used the same uh, strategy that they used and found out you have 99% of a banana uh, in you. And he, all he did is obviously it was satire. It, it was a joke, but he did that to, to show those guys like, I can take what you're doing and do that to anything and show that, oh, we evolved from a banana. It's, I mean, you might think with the way they're thinking, but uh, other than that, uh, anyone can tell that we didn't come from a banana. Okay, so that's what he says. And like I said, he's got a few issues. Um, but he got put in the hot seat not too long ago, and he lost a lot of his sales. So in his book, Misquoting Jesus, uh, What's happening here, this is an updated version of his book. It's not his textbook. Uh, it's a later uh, updated version. And in the back is a uh, part where he's being interviewed by the scholarly community, okay? People who know their stuff. Before it was a college lecture, people who don't know what's going on, they're gullible, and they honestly probably don't have anyone representing the Bible well to combat him. This is when he's talking to people who know their stuff, aren't gullible, are interested in facts, and interested in even the way that he terms things. 
This is what he says. Bruce Mexer, which he's a Bible scholar, right? He believes that the Bible's true and should be trusted. Is one of the greatest scholars of modern times. And I dedicated the book to him because he was both my inspiration for going into textual criticism and the person who trained me in the field. I have nothing but respect and admiration for him. And even though we may disagree on important religious questions, he, his is a firmly committed Christian and I am not. We are in complete agreement on the number of very important historical and textual questions. What are those questions and agreements? If he and I were put in a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original text of the New Testament probably looked like, there would be very few points of disagreement, maybe one or two dozen places out of many thousands. The position I argue for in misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's uh, position that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by the textual variance in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Is that talking out both sides of your mouth or what? We see a video and he says there's more contradictions than there are words. And then we get to here and he says, okay, if, if I were with Bruce Metzger, a guy who's very well known in the community for textual criticism and is a devout Christian, if him and I were put in the same room, we'd probably only disagree on a very few different things. And my guessing is that it's probably how do you word the things. And uh, you know, so even in, in our language, one word can have several meanings, right? You look up a word, and usually on a, a dictionary, there's definition one, definition two, three, some probably five, six, seven. Same thing with the Greek, right? But not only do they have that, they'll have six or seven words for the same feeling, and then all those words have six or seven different definitions. So you get, you get you know, 30, 40 combinations for one word. That's a lot of work, and that's what he's going to be talking about here. And when he says, you know, there's just a few places out of thousands that we would actually disagree. It's what word or what definition would that word be? So this is what he says when he's in front of people that he can't lie to. Do you notice the difference between the two sets of commentary he gives? Absolutely. Okay, so one of the arguments against the Bible is that the Bible is full of errors, right? We can't trust it. It's full of errors. So nearly every error can be explained by reading the biblical context. Almost every error can be explained by reading the biblical context. Okay, so the example I gave earlier, Jesus is recorded as dying on the Passover, and he's also recorded as dying on the day of preparation for the Passover. That would seem like an error, right? That's an apparent error to our understanding. And then you read the context and you find out it's not an error whatsoever. We misunderstood it. Okay, so this is something that happens all the time. People say, well, what about this? It's like, have you read the Bible before? Try reading the chapter, read a few verses, read the book, and then if you still have questions, ask someone else, because there are some questions that are hard to answer unless you understand the difference between the New and Old Testament, right? There's a lot of questions that come into, uh, or a lot of things that come into question when you don't have a good definition of New and Old Covenant theology. So those are things, genealogies can be this way. So reading the biblical context goes very, very, very far. Okay, so the rest can be explained by cultural geographical context. So here's an example, Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Uh, you remember this is uh, talking about Antioch, and this is the first church that is made up of Gentiles. And now this is important to, uh, to know, Antioch is north, Jerusalem is south. Okay, but this is what the Bible says. Some prophets went down to Antioch from Jerusalem. Jerusalem's down here, Antioch's up here. And it says they went down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Well, no, the way we would say that is that you go up from Jerusalem to Antioch, right? So we'd say, oh, well, these guys wrote the book way after. They weren't aware uh, of the geography or anything like that, therefore... You can't trust it. No. So this is what we actually know. So what we see is back in that time, we say north, south, east, west. We use the cardinal directions, right? Do you think they used those? No. So they used elevation, right? Jerusalem was a city built on a what? Built on a hill. 
So how would you go to Jerusalem? Down or up? You would go up Jerusalem. So even though in our understanding you're going down to Jerusalem, you're heading south, or if you're going to Antioch, you're heading north, they would say you're going down because of elevation or you're going up because of elevation, depending on where you were going. So obviously, this isn't a contradiction in terms. This is just something that we don't understand because we talk in a different way. Um, okay, so here's another argument that people use against the Bible. The Bible was written a long time ago. So this is actually a convenient feature for us to prove the Bible because we have a lot more evidence to compare it. Because now we've had 2,000 plus years uh, for some of these writings to appear and collect more and more and more of that we can uh, table. That way we can use as evidence later on. So the oldest book in our Bible is 3,500 plus years old. Just a little trivia question. Does anyone know what the oldest book in our Bible is? Job, good. Yeah, why is it not Genesis? Yeah, Moses wrote Genesis. So Moses is during, the, he's a patriarch. But you remember, he's after uh, Joseph sometime, where Job is during the patriarchal age where the father is, you know, the family's free, the father is providing the sacrifice for the kids, and that's what the patriarchal uh, age means. Basically means that the father is rule, uh, leading the house religiously. There's not a priest or a, a prophet or a king or a judge or anyone leading them, but rather the father of the household is leading everybody. So that's how we know that Job actually... Uh, predates uh, Moses, and he's sometime comparable to, to Abraham, is the guess. They might have been contemporaries, in other words, they might have lived at the same time in history, um, or Job might predate him or, or live after him sometime. But when you think of Abraham's time period and all the things he went through, just remember that was the basic culture that Job lived in. Okay. So this would make us think that there's a greater potential um, to be corrupted and changed, right? When you have this much time, there's more chance for all these manuscripts to be corrupted. And uh, it's possible that, hey, the Bible that we have right here isn't the Bible that the apostles wrote, right? That, that's what that time would indicate. And then we find something, okay? The Dead Sea Scrolls. So we found these not, not too long ago, uh, some 80 years no, 70 years, something like that. Um, I got the date right there. How about that? Um, dating to 3rd century B.C. to 1st century B.C. So we talked about the Essenes. Does everybody remember the Essene group of the Jews that we talked about? So those are the guys that uh, moved out uh, in the area where John the Baptist uh, moved to. And right, you remember he's in the wilderness. Uh, for us, it would be just east of Jerusalem between there and the Jordan. Uh, so John the Baptist is living in that wilderness. The Essenes moved out there. In a lot of ways, they're kind of like the Amish community where they remove themselves from the public, but they're also different <laughs> in a lot of ways. So these guys were purists of Judaism. And what they did is they wrote all these Dead Sea Scrolls. They kept them in a pot. And the story goes that a, a shepherd boy is running around these old cave systems and he grabs a rock and he's throwing it at a bird or one of his sheep run away and he's angry at it. But basically throws it, it lands in this hole and he hears something crack, something shatters. And then when he looks there, he sees all these old scrolls. And that's how we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls because the Dead Sea is in that area. And uh, people made uh, basically a living quarters there and now they're gone. Uh, so... And this one example, we found 15 manuscript pieces. Some of them are complete scrolls, some are smaller pieces. Obviously, you can imagine uh, being as old as they are, you know, almost a few thousand years old. Uh, there's things that can go wrong, right? Paper doesn't last forever. So the fact that there's much left as there is, it's pretty incredible. So we have 15,000 pieces from varying size, you know, a sentence, paragraph to whole books. And collectively, we can account for every book in the Old Testament, plus the Maccabean War. And uh, we're going to talk about this more next week, but why might the Maccabean War uh, or the book of Maccabees be included in there? 
Remember the Maccabean War that took place um, prior to Jesus, where the Jews tried to overthrow Rome? You think that's an important part of Jewish history? Yeah, do you think they might keep it for sentimental reasons, knowing that these guys were extremists and wanted the Romans to all die? Yeah. Uh, we also find a lot of other things in there, uh, like the war scrolls, and that was basically a prophecy the Essenes had where the children of light, them, were going to kill all the Romans. Um, didn't, didn't come true. They're dead. Um, so we find tons of evidence during this. Now, why this is so important? Because we have some few thousand years between your Bible and the apostles. So if anything's going to change there, how would we know? If we can find books of the Bible. And actually, that's wrong. There's more than a few thousand years here. We have 3,500 years between this and, and us, right? Because the Old Testament's what's being found here. So 3,500 years where it could be corrupted. And they open this up. And how many errors do you think they found between this and the, the Old Testament you have? This many. What your Old Testament says is found in these Dead Sea Scrolls. And so we know that even though there was 3,500 years of possible corruption, despite all the men, all the translations, we still have a copy that can be trusted and is reliable because it matches up with these Dead Sea Scrolls that are thousands of years old. Okay, so another explanation or argument against the Bible is that the Bible is written to explain the world to ancient culture. So even today, many theories like the multiverse, steady state theory, and others uh, held by scientists are recycled ancient ideas. So the slope of the earth. Did you guys know the slope of the earth was first calculated within 40 years of Jesus? Now, we don't think about that. We think about that being a modern thing. But within 40 years of Jesus, we found the curvature of the earth. And that was a dude that walked between two cities and basically um, measured a shadow or a string or something like that, if I remember. But pretty incredible uh, theory. So people would say, oh, well, they're just explaining the ancient world. A lot of the theories we have in modern science, the theories that the scientists are trying to use to disprove Christianity and indoctrinate our kids are actually written 2,000 years ago. Do you think these guys knew something about the world? Absolutely. They weren't idiots. They were incredibly smart. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, and it wasn't even until uh, the 1960s that the scientists caught up with the first three world, uh, words of the Bible in the beginning. For a very long time, even in our history in America uh, and the schools, it was mandatory to teach steady state theory which means that the, the universe is eternal. There's no beginning, no end. Well, if, if this world has always been here, there's no need for a creator, right? Doesn't need Something that always exists doesn't need to be created. That's why God has no creator, because he always existed. So they said, ah, there's no God. The world's always been here. And then we find out, oh, wait, the world does have a beginning, right? They look at radiation and other things in space, and they find out that there was, in fact, a beginning to this world, which means there had to be a creator. So it wasn't until the 1960s in America that we caught up to the first three words of the Bible. And I think, personally, that we still have uh, pretty far ways uh, to go. So some people say the Bible is too hard to understand. Well, most people that make this statement haven't genuinely sat down uh, to try to read it. And personally, I think one of the worst things a new Christian can do, and you can disagree with me and be wrong if you want to, uh, but we can all have our opinions on this. I think one of the worst things a new Christian can do is open their Bible to Genesis and start reading. Now, I have a few reasons. The first one's practical. They're going to get to Leviticus and they're going to stop. Or Numbers or Deuteronomy. The other thing that's going to happen, it's going to take them a while to read that Bible. And they're going to start thinking they need to offer sacrifices. Or think the church is hypocritical for not offering sacrifices. They're going to have no idea of the context uh, during the time of the prophets, priests, and, and kings. No, no historical context. Okay? And then all of a sudden, they're, if they finally make it to Matthew, here comes Jesus. Uh, and at this point, they're basically a Jew. And their faith has also been lost because the Old Testament ends with them being destroyed. 
So it's not the best place to start in the Old Testament, in my opinion. I think the best place a Christian can start is in the New Testament working forward because the first most important doctrine we can have is a Christian doctrine, not the doctrine of the Jews or the patriarch or any of these doctrines, but rather the Christian doctrine. And I think that's the one we need to start practicing on before we start understanding the religion of Judaism. Is it important to understand uh, Judaism and everything the Israelites went through? Absolutely, because all that points forward to Christ. And that just shows how awesome God is. But it's not what gets you into heaven. The Old Testament isn't going to get you into heaven without the knowledge of the New Testament. That's why it's called the good news, the gospel. And personally, I, I think if you're going to read the Bible for the first time, um, I don't even know if you should start at all the Gospels. I think the best thing to do is to start at John. I had to go through in my head real quick. I was like, is it Luke or John? Uh, John, and then you get into Acts. So you see the life of Jesus. You see the ministry of the church. And then after that, you get into the doctrine of the church. But before that... You know who Jesus is and his character, and you see the establishment of the church. And that's just my opinion. Okay, and then here's my second point. So if the Bible is hard, so I believe that everything intelligence does has a purpose. Everything intelligence does has a purpose, right? Why might I create a hammer? Because I got a nail, right? Why might I start the car? Because I need to go somewhere. Why might I put some food in the oven? Because I'm hungry. Right? Everything intelligence does has a purpose behind it. God is intelligent, which means when he does something, there is a purpose behind it. What would, what would be the purpose if the Bible was hard, which I don't necessarily side that it is? Why might God do that? What if it was a challenge to us? What if there was something that profited us when we struggled to wrestle with Scripture? What if that benefited our faith and taught us something about faith, what faith truly is? If that taught us how to trust God in those moments when we don't understand what He's saying. If that taught us how to be disciplined and search the Word and be approved a worthy steward of God's Word and what He said. What if there's a purpose behind the challenge of understanding the Bible. You know something, you can study the Bible your whole life and you're not going to know much of any of it. Now, I'm serious about that. Even the smartest people will not know near everything there is to know. I was talking uh, to Kyle earlier today and I remember what my professor talked about. He said, you know, people will spend eight years of their life getting a doctor's degree on a very specific field. They will spend years shadowing in that field and the rest of their life practicing and researching in that field. And a four-year-old can ask them why, and they might have an answer. Ask them why again, they might still have an answer. You ask why a third time, they're starting to run out of answers. And you ask them why four or five times, and they're clueless. You can study your whole life to know every, uh, all that you can about one topic, and a four-year-old can destroy your understanding or your confidence of your understanding with just a few questions. That's why four-year-olds are maddening. And really, there's nothing in this world that we understand enough uh, to be able to answer the why question that many times in a row. Right? Because the, the answers get pretty dynamic pretty quick. Right? Why do the leaves turn green? Oh, because chlorophyll. Well, why does the chlorophyll do that? Oh, because of... Photosynthesis. Why photosynthesis? Be uh, uh, yeah, eventually you're like, ah, God did it that way. Be quiet, right? So kids have a way of showing how little we actually know. Maybe that's the reason why a lot of people get annoyed with them at that stage. Uh, so I think there might be a reason uh, why God allows us to wrestle. Because truth is, if you're not wrestling with something in the scripture, you're probably not growing in your faith. If you've got it all hammered out, you got it all figured out, and you're giving everybody advice and never taking it, you got something wrong with your faith, if you can even call it that. Okay, so some people say the Bible doesn't name real uh, people or places. So 1961, an inscription with Pilate's name was found on it. Uh, before that, we didn't think he actually existed because, interestingly enough, there's not many Roman documents that record Pilate. 
So they're like, oh, well, the Romans always kept a great detail on these matters and we're not finding them, therefore the Bible's got it wrong. And then we find uh, where he was buried. Uh, so 1968, the Apostle Peter's home was discovered. And they have a whole museum built out over top of this. Did you get to see that? that that's a pretty impressive building, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 1990, an ossuary was found that contains the bones of the high priest Caiaphas. Uh, Caiaphas. He was the high priest during the time of Jesus. And you know what they found in his uh, ossuary? So it was him, they suppose a wife, some kids that died during the, the War of Antiquity. Um, they found at that time one of three crucifix nails. Now, nails would often be reused because obviously it's... You imagine if you had to bust open a rock and make iron from nothing, you're probably not going to just bury that and throw it away like we do and pick it up in a tire later. They're, you're going to pull that out and reuse it if it's able to be reused. And if not, you're probably going to put it in the forge and turn it into something else. But he kept one of the three at that time only crucifix nails that we ever had. Now, I don't know who that was. I don't think anyone can prove definitively, but what if that was Jesus' Christ? And if it was Jesus's, what would that say about Caiaphas? Either an extreme amount of regret that he could never let go of or some pride that he lived uh, with until he died. It's one of those two things. It's, um, that's an instrument of death. That's a weird thing to have. 1993 found the monument uh, to the King David. So this is interesting. People who know nothing about the Bible come. They say King David never existed. Nope, doesn't exist. And then we find his, uh, we find his place. So uh, less than half a year ago around the Dead Sea uh, in a layer of sediment that contained a, a fragments uh, today around the time of Moses, there's a five foot thick ash layer there. Now, so what happened is, is there's some sort of fire that got so hot that the fire had to at least be 3,500 degrees, which is hot, for 30 seconds to create this glass. They dig, they find this glass, they have no clue, and then they find the ash layer. This would have been uh, right at the place of Sodom and Gomorrah. Geographically, the same place as Sodom and Gomorrah. There's nothing left of this city. Little chunks of like brick and glass where it melted the sand. Other than that, there's nothing left to tell us about what happened to this city. But we know that the timing is right and the, uh, uh, the, the place is right that this would match basically exactly where and when Sodom and Gomorrah burned up in flames. That's pretty neat, huh? And actually, I talked to a guy that visited this area a few years ago, and he says, when you go out there, it smells like sulfur. The, he didn't know about this study, or they found this, because he visited. He said, when you get out to this area, it smells like sulfur. And the, the tour guide was telling him how it always has that smell, and they assumed it had something to do with that sea uh, of some sort, some sort of mineral or something in it baking in the sun. They start digging. They find out there's a reason it smelled like sulfur. Everything burned up. Okay, so this is Joseph's tomb. So we look at uh, the Egyptian or, or Egypt during the time, and where the like general of Egypt would have been buried. There's this little tomb, and above it is the name. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, it, but you guys remember how they changed Joseph's name to the Egyptian thing, right? It's got like a Z in it, some H's and R's, and I'm not even going to try, right? Um, but they find his name, an Egyptian, uh, inscribed above it. And there are no bones in it. Were there supposed to be bones in Joseph's tomb? What did he request it, uh, to happen with his bones? Yep, he said, I want to be buried in my homeland. Which is interesting, because for the most part, Joseph never lived in his home. Right? He got kicked out pretty early on in his life. But he said, I want to be buried in my home. Okay, so how about consistency? 25,000 manuscripts, we're going to take the conservative side. 25,000 manuscripts with 98% consistency. 
2% of your Bible might be inconsistent. That should be alarming. But we're going to talk about those inconsistencies. So 98%, no question asked. Now, he said we can't calculate that. The reason we can't calculate that is because we're finding so many, it's impossible to always update the system. And two, uh, a lot of these weren't in the system yet because we're just starting to dig in the areas where we're, we're finding them, tons of them. Uh, so all of these now, we can compare them, and they have some awesome ways that I shouldn't say awesome. God's awesome. Um, Pi is not awesome. God's awesome. That's what George Paul taught us in seminary. Um, some pretty incredible ways that they would test these and, and they can scan them and have all these different uh, scanned copies. But there's 2% uh, error rate or inconsistencies, and let's talk about this. So 2%, 100 marbles, 2 marbles. 100 marbles are good, or well, you have 100 marbles, 98 marbles are good, we're looking at 2 marbles. 95% of those 2 marbles are typos. Okay, these are the typos. Manuscript 1, blessed are the eek, blessed are the mech, blessed are the mech, blessed are the me. Okay, so you take all these different manuscripts, all these different copies of the same verse in the Bible, right? The, we know this to be out of the Sermon on the Mount. Can we know what this says? Blessed are the meek. Can I all of a sudden not know this doctrine? No, because I have so many copies that I could see and I can take M, E, E, K, and I say, blessed are the meek. 95% of those 2% are here. Okay, so that's two, that, two marbles, right? One don't have to worry about. 5% of one of those marbles. 5% of the 2% aren't this. 5% of the 2% aren't this. We're not talking about much, okay? Uh, get one marble, take 99 marbles, put it over here, one marble, and try to cut 5% of that off. Figure out a way to do it without cutting your finger off, and then bring that in next week, and you'll be amazed. Um, so we can know what this says. We're not talking about much that's at question here. Okay, so how about the five less than 5% of the, the less than 2%? Well, if you had 1,000 manuscripts, 20 of the 1,000 would uh, have something to pay attention to. Uh, by the time you whittle this down, one verse in 1,000 has a consistency issue. And then the vast majority of these are single words. Or the way that it says words. Sometimes a verse will say uh, Christ Jesus. Sometimes it says Jesus Christ. Is there a difference between those? Nope, it doesn't. Okay, that's a lot of those. Sometimes one whole word would be out, like uh, the word brethren didn't get put here, or the word the didn't get put here, right? Articles, very small things for the most part, aren't being included in here. And then occasionally there's a full verse. Now that's the one that we should pay attention to because the rest of these are very trivial. And you have to realize if you compare this to any other document, I mean, we're not talking about much. I get books all the time. I, re I read tons and tons and tons of books. And I get books all the time. And I'll have two books, a, a duplicate. And sometimes one of them will be different than the other. The pages are, aren't cut all the way. I've had that happen. Sometimes the pages are cut too much. Sometimes the binding's a little crooked. Sometimes there's a little ink dot at the top. Sometimes a number is slightly horizontal. I get that stuff all the time. That's with a modern printing press. They're doing better than us today with pen and paper. And it's not even pen and paper. It's uh, like a quill and ink bed or something. They're, I mean, it, it's pretty impressive the way they're doing this, right? Uh, so these full verses, though, Sometimes what will happen, so example uh, is like Mark 16, 16, is found within 98% of the manuscripts, but not found in the, the 2%. Okay, so this verse isn't found in all, all of the, the manuscripts that we have, but it's found 98% of them, which is a pretty solid number, right? Um, if doctor gave me a 98% chance to live, I'm going to go home, I'm going to eat, I'm going to sleep and not think about the other 2%. Um, so it's found within most, but not in everyone. And for those of you who don't know, that says whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe 
will be condemned. So even if this doesn't belong in your Bible, does that change any doctrine on condemnation, baptism, salvation, or belief? Does that change any of that? No. Do we know that if you're found outside of Christ, the second coming or your own ending of life, that there's not condemnation waiting? No, we know that. Do we need Mark 16, 16 to tell us that? No, we know that. How about baptism? Well, we got nine accounts in Acts, and every time someone's converted to Christ, every single one of them gets baptized. Jesus says, unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, right? There's one time where uh, Paul's talking to these disciples of John. He said, well, don't you have the Holy Spirit? They're like, we've never even heard of one. He said, then what baptism were you baptized into? If baptism had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, why would he say, what baptism are you baptized into? That wouldn't make sense. If those things weren't related, that'd be like if Woody over here was feeling sick in his stomach. I said, well, what shoes are you wearing? That'd be dumb. Right? I might ask, what are you eating? Because that's obviously related. Did you exercise any? I, always, I know when I exercise, I don't feel good. But I'm going to ask something that's related to that. Right? So why would he ask, well, what baptism were you baptized into? Because there's something that the apostles knew and the early church was taught as a connection between baptism and the Holy Spirit. Okay, how about salvation? Do you need this verse to know that Jesus Christ saves? No, for God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but live eternally. We know that. How about belief? Does anyone in here... If you don't have this verse in your Bible, does anyone in here doubt whether or not you should believe Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? No, we repeat that every Sunday morning. Someone's baptized or placed their membership here. Why? Because that's the good confession found in Acts. All these things, anything that is questionable, which I don't think they're really questionable, um, all these things are always repeated somewhere else. So can we trust the Bibles we have today? Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Okay. Um, we'll talk about this one, then we'll end it. Okay, so we don't have the originals. We actually don't know this. And it's a good thing we don't know, uh, know if we have the originals. If we had the originals, what could we do to them? We could change them. If we don't know which one of the originals, how are we supposed to change it? can't. And I have a lot more on this. And like I said, if you have any further questions, we can, uh, you can watch the video on our YouTube page, Who Dares Trust the Bible? And that has tons more details like literacy during that time and uh, the Hebrew curse tablet and different things, which, by the way, was confirmed. Um, so there's a lot more details on that. Does anyone have any questions, comments? That's true. Yeah, so, and, uh, and apologetics, it's good to know our faith is true. But we ultimately have to have faith that Jesus Christ is the truth. Yeah, you know, it's the best faith is one based off a, a conviction, and you can't have conviction without evidence. It's what converted the early church, right? Everybody knew of uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why there were the 12 disciples plus the 500. Any other thoughts? Okay. Uh, Larry, would you mind closing us in prayer?